Yeah, and when it's hot, summertime in Texas, uh, it can be nice to get into here. But the Alamo, I mean, was was uh, kind of a last uh, a last ditch effort to find a place of shelter, and it really wasn't meant to withstand the kind of assault that it experienced. So when you go there, you're like, "This is it. This is the this is the big deal. This is not a very big place." Well, yeah, right. That's uh, kind of the. I'm sure that's what uh, Jim Bowie and and uh, Davy Crockett were thinking as the Mexican army closed in. Anyway, here's where we're going to go with this. We need to look at the consequences of Andrew Jackson's uh, decisions on the U.S. Bank. As we talked about yesterday, uh, Henry Clay of Kentucky, remember Speaker of the House, and another important Senator, Daniel Webster, had put the bank up for debate prematurely. They did it to try to make the bank the, the deciding issue of the election against Andrew Jackson. They kind of had a good sense that Jackson was going to veto the bank. And they hoped that the American people would be upset by that and then vote Jackson out of office. Okay, What, what the two supporters of the bank didn't realize and the two people that were trying to get Jackson out of uh, office didn't realize is that the American people say they care about the economy, they say they care about finances, but they really just don't. They vote for their own interests, they vote for people they like, they identify with, and we've already talked about the countless reasons why Andrew Jackson was like the people's man, right? So, as much as Henry Clay and Daniel Webster represented what was probably best for our economy, uh, they, they bet on the wrong horse for the election. This political cartoon up here, we have several of those figures. Okay, we've got Andrew Jackson leaving office and looking back to see how things are going now that the uh, Bank of the United States has basically been defunded. Now, here's the character of the bank. This old mother bank vomiting out money into this sick bowl here on the side. Well, poor, um, poor Mr. Biddle, right? We talked about uh, Nick Biddle and his bank. Nick Biddle is nurturing his bank as it, as it slowly dies because Jackson defunded it. He took the government's money out of the U.S. bank and basically left banking to private, private business. Here we have a standoff. We've got Henry Clay, we've got uh, Daniel Webster, and we've got Martin Van Buren deciding what to do next with this dead, this dead behemoth, All right? So if you do come across this cartoon in uh, a multiple choice series or an essay, like a DBQ essay down the road, hopefully you'll be able to identify some of those features. Just, yeah, go ahead. What's the scary thing behind the uh, you know, I don't know who that figure is, and that's a good point to make here. That yeah, that terrifying, monstrous-looking figure. I'd have to, I'd have to do some research. I'm sure there's an answer to it. Yeah, but I want to tell you guys something. Most likely, if you get a visual aid, which is great, you're like, yes, I don't have to read anything. There will be parts of a visual aid you don't understand. Sometimes you can't read the captions, okay? Or sometimes you can only read a portion, or there may be a figure you don't recognize. Look for those things that do stand out to you, because most likely the cartoon was chosen for what people in your position will recognize, not the minutia that is really um, too far in depth to be, be of concern. So we can see Andrew Jackson, we can see the bank vomiting out money. There would be just enough information here, probably in the caption, to help make sense of it all. But we can see here, this is a reflection on Jackson's final acts at taking out uh, the bank. In um, the election of 1832, Jackson went toe-to-toe -to -toe again with Henry Clay. Uh, and we can see here Jackson, uh, Old Hickory, 
tough, rough, ready to fight. Uh, political cartoons often show him kind of as a brawler. All right. So the charter was denied. So the bank is going to die in 1836 as Jackson uh, is leaving office. Let's talk about the consequences of that. But before I put these notes up here, I'm just pause this for a second. Here's what I want you to think. Okay. You guys know basic economic principles, right? Are people good at saving money? No. no. So when they get money, they tend to spend it, right? When people spend money or they, they have money, they demand things to spend money on. When demand is high, what happens to prices? Huh? They go up. Things that are valuable, that are in high demand, what happens to their price? It goes up. Yeah. I mean, what's the, like I saw Nintendo Switch, I saw Apple um, uh, iPhones and those kinds of things. They all hold their price. Right? They keep their prices high. A diamond. I just watched this cool documentary about diamonds, how the supply of diamonds is highly regulated so that they hold their value or their value will go up. So supply and demand, the more demand there is, the higher the prices go. Land, for example. Look at Bennington. Right, People want to live here. A small chunk of land is going for like $150,000. The, the land is worth more than the house that sits on it because of demand. So when President Jackson trashes the U.S. bank and private banks, what are nicknamed a lot of times as pet banks or uh, because of how speculative they were, how out of control they were, they're called wildcat banks. Think about a wildcat. It looks tame. It looks cuddly but it's totally unpredictable. Cash flow, Westerners get what they wanted. They wanted high cash flow, okay? So people with money in their pockets, ready to buy stuff, drive prices up. But here's what also happens. What happens, economic principle number two, as you increase money supply? Inflation, the value of the dollar goes down, right? The value of the dollar goes down while prices continue to go high. This is a recipe for disaster. It means you have to spend more money to get the same amount of stuff. And eventually people won't be able to afford the things that they need or they want. So what happens when demand stops? Just as a review, back to principle number one. What happens if demand diminishes? What happens to prices? They go down, they plummet. In a recession, a bubble bursts. At some point, land here in Bennington is going to hit its maximum, and fewer people are going to want to move here or can afford to live here. Imagine being the last person to buy a house in Bennington at a high price, and then the market goes down. That person is immediately losing their investment. Right? They got to hope that over time it'll come back up and beyond where they were. But that land now is worth less than it was purchased for. People can't pay those loans or they don't want to pay those loans or they don't have the money to pay those loans. Banks come in and they try to take their land or they try to repossess their property one way or another and a person loses their resources. Banks aren't retail companies. Okay, banks aren't real estate agencies. They can't pay their bills with land and no one wants to buy it from the bank. So the bank stock is going to go down too. These banks and this whole inflation caused exactly by the things that uh, the National Republicans had warned about start to happen by 1839. Okay. There's going to be a big panic. we start to see this big cycle between boom, which is a high point, a bull market, and a bust, a bear market, where prices drop on expensive goods, people have no money because of inflation, their money is worthless, and we go into recession. Jackson's retired by this point. The person left holding the bag 
is going to be uh, is going to be Martin Van Buren. There's another side effect of this whole issue dealing with the banks. So we saw back with John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams declared himself a national Republican in his reelection, but he was a Democratic Republican first. Andrew Jackson was a Democratic Republican. Henry Clay was. All of these, we were the one party system in the era of good feelings. Like I said, we start to see the solidification of a new party. That party is going to be called the Whigs. Okay? Now, a lot of people think Whig, the name Whig comes from white wigs. And that's a good way of remembering it because the original presidents, you know, they wore a powdered wig or two. And the whole point of the Whig party was to make a stable government. But this kind of Whig, W-H-I-G, those were Whigs back in Britain that fought against the crown's tyrannical power. They're the ones that championed the rights of Englishmen, and they're the ones that encouraged Americans to fight for their rights. The whole point of the Whig Party, at least at first, was demanding a government that was in control. Everyone thought Jackson was out of control, power hungry. You guys remember looking at the political cartoon of him as an emperor, right? He had taken up too much power, People had lost their rights. They were losing their property. The Whigs represented limited government and yet still progressive government. I'll show you how. But before that, look at this political cartoon. Now this looks like currency, I realize that, but it's actually a political cartoon. There's no such thing as humbug glory bank. You've probably heard the word humbug from a Christmas carol. Ah, bah humbug, right? Humbug means ill wishes or nasty feelings. Okay, To be a humbug is somebody who's a sourpuss. So this humbug bank, this bank of bad feelings, not real. Okay, This currency, not real. It's a commentary on these wildcat banks that Jackson had created. How do I know that? Well, one of the things that's on it is a hickory leaf, old hickory. We've got Jackson's top hat and spectacles. And then this thing, what is it? A donkey, a donkey. or a mule. a mule or an ass. an ass. People thought Jackson was a stubborn old ass and they told him so. They made cartoons of, of it. They, he became uh, portrayed in the media as a jackass. And you know what that old jackass did? He said, you can't hurt me with that. And he embraced the donkey as his party symbol. And to this day, the Democrats, their party symbol is the jackass because they're stubborn and unmovable. Okay? The elephant will come along much later for Republicans. Okay? But we're starting to see those images there. If you see a donkey in a political cartoon dated in the Jacksonian era, take note. So these uh, bank notes would be pretty worthless if they came from an unstable bank. Even Jackson knows that. Okay, Let me show you how. Before he left office, he made a rule that the government would not sell federal land for paper currency, it would only sell land for gold and silver. So even though he gave the people what they wanted and defunded the US bank, he's like, the government is not going to get tangled up in these unstable investments with, with the wildcat banks. That's called species circular or hard money. Now back to the Whigs. What did the Whigs stand for? stood for a lot of different and conflicting policies. One thing that's important to note about the Whigs, they were not a sectional party. They had supporters in the North that wanted a stable currency and good banks. They had supporters in the South that hated Jackson for the, uh, for the whole tariff standoff, the whole uh, tariff of abominations and the nullification crisis. They were in favor of states' rights. He, they had supporters in the West who wanted better infrastructure, so they were one of the first all-section parties, okay? 
They also unify people around progressive values. Now we are not at this point going to talk about the second great awakening, but you should have read, or you sh some of you have already read Walt Whitman, right? Uh, Henry David Thoreau, some of those transcendentalists. Some of you actually go to Methodist churches, Baptist churches, um, Presbyterian churches, those American uh, evangelical uh, Protestant churches. There's this whole social movement that's focused on the self and, uh, you know, enlightenment and kind of, the, well, how would you describe Henry David Thoreau? Living out in the wilderness, watching the ants, fighting against the government, right? Very much kind of focused on, um, well, for now we'll say focused on the self. But those folks tend to gravitate towards the Whig party too because the Democrats stand for authority under Andrew Jackson. Okay, so ready for round three, the Jacksonites versus everybody else. The election of 1836, Andrew Jackson leaves office, still a very popular figure, but he follows the two-term precedent and he hand selects Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren has a nickname. He's the little magician. He's a politician who seems to be able to make politics work. He can manipulate, he can, he can cooperate, he has a way of getting things done but he's a party man. He's a loyalist to Jackson and Jackson likes it that way. Um, Martin Van Buren uh, is chosen by the Democratic Party, but Jackson had decided on this beforehand. Um, the Whigs, on the other hand, fall into the trap that we've seen before. There are four different Whigs that run for president. Why is that a problem? Just kind of as a as a spot check. Because it'll be hard to win electoral votes. It's going to be hard to win electoral votes. If you're a Democrat today, take note. If there isn't a Democrat the nation can get behind, the Democrats and independents, third parties will divide one another and President Trump will win by default. We saw the first third party in American history in the last election. It was the anti-Masonic party. Uh, Alacer, you're big on conspiracy theories and the Freemasons and the New World Order and that kind of thing. That anti-secret uh, society movement has been around for a long time. Those groups who tend to draw wealthy, kind of snooty, closed off, uh, powerful people, uh, they have been subject to scrutiny by popular opinion for a long time. And the anti-Masonics ran and they divided the vote and um, in some ways helped Jackson win in, the pre in, in 1832. So we have to be aware of that. Third parties and party division does, is not a successful recipe. And the Whigs learn that. They, their favorite candidate is William Henry Harrison. How do we know Harrison? He's going to be a future president and his legacy as president is talking out in the cold for two hours and dying a couple of weeks later. One of the shortest serving president in American history. But we've dealt with General Harrison before. He was the champion of Tippecanoe. He's the one that defeated the Native American tribes in the Northwest. He's an American hero from the War of 1812 era, right? And he's gonna make a comeback, at least to win an election down the road, but it's not his turn in 1836. Instead, it's the fox, it's the little magician, it's uh, little Van, Martin Van Buren, uh, who wins pretty handedly against the div divided Whig field. Here's something important to note about Martin Van Buren. If you, I mean, just this kind of trivia fact puts things into perspective. He is the first American president born under the United States flag. All presidents prior to Martin Van Buren had been born in a, in a British colony, right? Even George Washington, who never left North America, was born as a British citizen. So 
Martin Van Buren starts this new generation of American presidents who were literally born as American citizens as opposed to something else. We have pretty much covered one of two major issues Van Buren is going to face that make him a one-term president. He gets to deal with the fallout of the bank crisis. Okay? He's going to get the financial panic of 1837. The other one that we have yet to talk about is what to do about Texas. Now here, just while I see you writing furiously, let me say this about Texas. Did you know that Texas is the largest purchaser of textbooks? As a state, it's got more students than I think just about any other state. And they purchase a ton of textbooks. Textbook manufacturers are headquartered in Texas, so they focus on Texas history disproportionately. So it's part of a conspiracy. That's actually been proven true. In order to sell textbooks, you gotta write what people wanna hear. And so Texas history is gonna be a part of this lecture. Um, rising prices and then a bubble bursting, especially with land, inflation, those things lead to a financial collapse in 1837. If you're keeping track, we've seen this before, right? This is the same reason why there was the panic of 1819. People are greedy. They want what others have. They will borrow instead of save. They will purchase something way overpriced, especially when they haven't worked hard for that money. And then the price bubble eventually bursts and the people that purchase at high levels then face a loss of income or loss of wealth as the market craps around them. This is not a West issue, not a South issue, not a North issue. This is a United States issue. Okay. All sections of America experienced this recession in 1837, and Martin Van Buren's left holding the back. So how do you get the economy going again? And folks, we're dealing with that issue right now. Uh, the worst economic recession other than the Great Depression. So the second worst economic depression that our country faced was in uh, 2007, 2008, okay? President Obama inherited a mess, okay? And how to address that mess, there's really two ways to go about it. One is to let people suffer and eventually the market will kind of correct itself, right? People will die or they'll become homeless or they'll thin themselves out, whatever it is, they'll cut back on their, on their lifestyles and, and they'll struggle through. Or you can infuse the system with money. Now there's provides two options as well. The way to infuse money into the system, number one, you can allow those with money to have more of their own money. You can cut taxes so that people with money feel less pressure and they will spend that extra money instead of on taxes, they'll spend it on other stuff. The other way that you generate, get things going, is through what's called a subsidy or uh, through a stimulus. A stimulus is when the government infuses money into certain businesses, into certain activities, right, to get the market rolling again. For example, okay, building bridges, usually undergone by public works, right? All the road work that we see in the summertime here in Omaha, the capital of potholes, that's public money doing that. So the people that are working road construction jobs, even though they work for a private company, their pay 
for their company is coming in part through public funds. When President Obama inherited uh, the uh, bad economy, one of the major industries that was failing was American auto industry. Ford, Chrysler, GM, they were close to bankruptcy. So President Obama and his administration gave money to the automotive industry directly and indirectly. There was this program called Cash for Clunkers, where you could take your old car with low gas mileage and you'd get federal money to buy a new American model with higher gas, gas economy. Worked out pretty good. You're not going to get much for a, you know, your 89 Corolla, but you can go and buy a nice Ford Focus and get more money for that old Corolla than you thought you should. So the Whigs want to infuse money into the system to get the economy rolling again. They want to bring back the bank. They want to have high tariffs. What do tariffs do? They protect manufacturers. So protect that business, make it more competitive again, make America great again, right? Well, uh, this time <coughs> it's going to work. Poor Martin Van Buren, he's left looking like a sap, okay? And he's going to be defeated. But really what it boils down to once again is image. He's defeated by William Henry Harrison, who's promoted as a guy who likes to drink hard cider and was born in a log cabin, okay? Guy you could sit down and have a beer with, okay? America's, Americans are lazy when it comes to economics. We're lazy when it comes to investigating political consequences. We're not lazy when we, it's like, oh, I like that guy. He's like me. There's one more issue though that plagues Martin Van Buren. And it really also is an issue for Andrew Jackson too. And that is Mexico. The Spanish empire has collapsed in North America and South America. There are going to be a whole host of revolutions and you can study those in world history or some other time. But we're going to concern ourselves with the Mexican revolution because it becomes a big issue for the United States. Illegal immigration is at the heart of this matter, okay? Illegal immigrants are flooding across the borders from the United States to Mexico, and it's going to create an international crisis. I'll say more in a minute. 1821, Mexico gets its independence. And in order to populate this Northern territory of Mexico, which is known as Tejas or Texas, Mexico turns to an American statesman and uh, wealthy politician, uh, Stephen Austin. Not Stone Cold Steve Austin, the wrestler, okay? But Stephen Austin, the politician from the West. They offer him a big contract to bring people, recruit people and bring them to Texas legally, okay? Bring them to Texas and make them Mexican. What does that mean? Well, it means help them adapt, uh, assimilate to Mexican values, what Mexican laws and rules are, their rights as Mexicans, Spanish, Catholicism, those kinds of things, you know, they encourage people to come and be Mexican that will be a better life. Oh, by the way, one of the parts of being Mexican is that Mexico's progressive enough that they've abolished slavery. Um, this is not gonna go so well in the populations that are recruited to, to Texas, okay? And we get criminal elements, we get explorers, we get all these kinds of pioneer folks going there, but the one thing they have in common is the idea that they can make bank off of the plantation system. And again, we've seen since 1820, uh, Missouri Compromise, that the South, its access to, to slave territory has shrunk. So Texas seems like a great opportunity if slavery is allowed. Well, Americans 
don't seem to get Mexican law, and they don't seem to give a damn about it either. So these illegal immigrants, these people who won't assimilate to their country's uh, rules and expectations become a thorn in their government's side. Now, Mexico is not, at this point, a democracy. It's not even a republic. It's led by a military ruler by the name of Santa Ana, dictator Santa Ana. If you're ever in California where there's little wildfires burning, hot, dry winds off the Pacific are called Santa Ana winds. They're named after this guy, okay? Because what Santa Ana is going to do as a response to these Texans disobeying national laws and stirring up all kinds of problems, encouraging the United States to come and liberate them, he is going to take the Mexican army and like a big hot blast of wind, fly up through the Sonoran Desert to put them in their place. Now the Texans prepare. They elect this guy, Sam Houston. Sam Houston becomes the governor of Texas and the commander in chief of the Texas Revolutionary Army. Rebels, this rebellion has a leader. This guy is also a wealthy American politician. He's got friends in high places. He's got money. He believes he's got allies in this conflict with Santa Ana. But in 1836, they don't show up. So when Santa Ana rolls into Texas with 6,000 men and all Sam Houston has been able to do is put together about 400, he's in a lot of trouble. Even though the Mexican army is close to starving, even though they're hot and tired, they're overwhelming in their numbers versus Sam Houston. The standoff finishes at the Alamo. Actually, it ends uh, at, the, at uh, Goliad, but everyone remembers the Alamo. Do you know why? The fighting is so brutal, it's so one-sided, and it kills some very important or interesting American figures. Davy Crockett, frontiersman. He was retired. He was actually a showman at this point, he'd go and do plays about his life, younger years, when he was exploring Kentucky and Tennessee. There was a whole song written about him. He was like a Hollywood celebrity. Jim Bowie, you know when Jim Bowie was famous? He had this huge knife. He had a huge knife, Bowie knife, hunting knife. In fact, it was dubbed the Bowie knife. If you you don't want to talk about the Rambo knife, that's actually a Bowie knife. And and he was this legendary fighter, supposedly really quick with his with his uh, with his Bowie knife. Uh, he he dies. Sam Houston, famous American. This lopsided victory and how much grit and determination those Texans showed in the face of overwhelming odds becomes a rallying point. It galvanizes Americans. That means before Americans were like, eh, yeah, go Texas. And after Americans were like, yeah, go Texas. Okay. So Sam Houston didn't have political support when it, he needed it in his lifetime the most. But after the Alamo and Goliad, the Americans come to call. The defeat at the Alamo brings a whole fresh wave of revolutionaries to Texas. And the remains of Santa Ana's forces are defeated at San Jacinto uh, on April 21st, 1836. So keep in mind, that's during Jackson's administration. This is going to continue to be a problem for Martin Van Buren. But as I'm coming close to the end of my lecture here, uh, the wave of new recruits to Texas defeat the tired, hot, hungry uh, Mexican army, and they literally capture Santa Ana and hold him at knife point and force him to sign a treaty giving Texas its independence. So now Texas is its own country. Before Texas was a state, it was its own country. 
Now, Texas doesn't necessarily want to stay its own country. It would be stronger if it was with the U.S. And by the way, Santa Ana is going to claim that that treaty was null and void because all along the Americans broke the rules. They came to Mexico illegally. They didn't abide by Mexican law, right? That he was forced at knife point to sign a treaty that he didn't agree to. Yeah, 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 Santa Ana. But as far as why Mexico doesn't become a state here in 1836 or 37, there's one answer for that. It's not that we're afraid of Santa Ana. It's not that we're afraid of Mexico. In fact, war could be a possibility at any point for the next decade. The reason we're afraid of Texas is because of slavery. Adding Texas to the United States would tip the balances between free and slave states, what many would say is unfairly in the South's advantage. Okay, so sectionalism issue comes up again. The South has to wait. Now keep that in mind because in a few decades, the North is gonna be like, hey, California gold winning Let's add it, right? Let's make that a state. Let's keep slavery free from California. And the South is going to go, you made us pay dearly to get Texas. There's still very limited space for us to expand and most of it's desert. So the, the feeling that the South is getting hosed in these, in these treaties is beginning. That's it for the day. Um, the Alamo movie we will show on Monday when you're done with your essay.